this uh, meeting back to order and uh, welcome everybody in the gallery. Uh, our first uh, delegate is uh, Rob, no stranger to the uh, to the front here before. Rob Lamoth of the uh, Alderman Norfolk Pride Committee with an update on the 2019 Pride Day event and community activities. Rob, the Thank you. The podium and floor is all yours. If you need, you can, uh, if you can't, you didn't remember, there's a button there that you can uh, elevate the podium. Oh. It'll bring it up to your stature there. Oh, so. yes. Thank you. Yeah. There you go. I like this. Yeah. And there's a timer as well. Oh, I've already started now. <laughs> How do I reset it? Uh, that's okay. We'll, uh, we'll tell you when you've uh, hit the end. Okay. It's so great to come here and see familiar faces it's wow it's so I was so intimidated the first time I was so scared yep. and uh, this is quite wonderful thank you everybody okay uh, I'm Rob Lamoth I'm here today on behalf of Pride Haldeman Norfolk but first of all we want to acknowledge that we are on land that has been inhabited by indigenous peoples for millennia we are grateful for the opportunity to live work and play here and we thank all those who have served as stewards of this special place Recognition of the important contributions of Indigenous peoples is consistent with our commitment to making the promises, promise of Canada's truth and reconciliation calls to action real in our community. I'm going to go back a couple of years now to the first annual Pride Haldeman Norfolk Day, which was celebrated on Saturday, May 24th, 2017 in Dunville Central Park. The group that organized this event was very small, with most of the work being done by three people. The main organizer, Ken Hancock, resides at Maple Grove Place and assisted living residents in Dunville. Ken is a senior and uses a wheelchair. Planning for the event began a year prior to the May 27, 2017 date. Some people wonder, why is an event like this necessary in Haldeman County? Well, Pride Day events are about enhancing the quality of life and well-being of all residents. It's a public gathering to support LGBTQ Two Spirit Plus community who are our family, friends, and our neighbors. By gathering in public, we say to the community that we believe in human rights and that we will stand up for them. We recognize that our LGBTQ Two Spirit Plus youth are particularly vulnerable to bullying and mental health issues, including higher suicide rates. A visible, tangible event like Pride Day conveys the message that they are accepted, valued, and loved. It allows them to make new connections in their community. It, all, it is also an opportunity to showcase performers and speakers from the LGBTQ two-spirited community. As we organized that inaugural Pride event in 2017, we, we identified that the lack of wheelchair access to the stage in Central Park would be a barrier. Haldeman County stepped up and provided a wheelchair ramp for our use that day. One of our performers, B. Flix, hi Craig, uses a motorized wheelchair, and he was very impressed, saying that it was the first time he had ever actually been able to perform on a public park stage in Haldeman County. The 2017 Pride event included local and area performers from Haldeman County and Six Nations. Speakers included Reverend Warren Bloomfield from Grace United Church in Dunville, Mark Enns, a teacher at Dunville Secondary School, Jennifer Jacobs, director, director at that time of nursing at Grandview Lodge, and several other youths and activists. The event was supported by some local businesses and organizations such as Sweet Retrospect, Deb's Cuisine on Queen, Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, Ontario Public Service Employees Union, Six Nations Pride, and Haldeman Artworks. A beautiful afternoon in Dunville Central Park attended by two or three hundred children, adults, and seniors. Lots of families, lots of smiling faces. A second-rate street preacher from Texas somehow made his way to Dunville to berate community members in the name of Christianity, but he was mostly ignored. He had no ampli amplification, and for, the most, for most of the event, he was a distance away from the Van Schell stage. He and his three or four miserable supporters couldn't dampen a lovely community event. Later, we learned the preacher's name was Jesse Morell, and we looked him up online. We found that he had posted this before the event, or maybe it was after. Some brethren in Canada heard that their small town called Dunville was going to have its first gay pride event. 
This unashamed public display of depravity deeply concerned them, so they thought we need to bring in a street preacher like Jesse Morrell to preach at this event. I was more than eager to go. They bought me a plane ticket, put me up in a nice bed and breakfast, and even arranged some speaking engagements in the area besides this outreach. The vast majorities of attendees at that 2017 Pride event were, of course, lovely people out for a nice afternoon in Central Park. Residents of Dunville and from all over Haldeman, Norfolk, people who travel from Niagara, Hamilton, Oakville, and Toronto to celebrate inclusion and diversity and to say this community accepts and values everyone equally. Cable Television 14 and reporters from Extra Magazine in Toronto covered our event. Haldeman Norfolk Pride Day was included in the SACOM's 150 Reasons to Visit Haldeman, and in the fall of 2017, our Pride Day won a Haldeman County Community Festival and Event Award. I don't have time to get into the incredible ways that Pride events drive economic development. We'll save that for another time, another action team or committee. I promised. As a result of the, su of the successful 2017 event, a fledgling Pride Committee emerged. Pride Hallman Norfolk is committed to promoting diversity and inclusion in our community and providing equal opportunities to people of all genders, sexual orientations, and gender identifications. We stand for human rights, period. 2018 saw that expanded core group uh, grow to eight to 12 people committed to carrying on the work of Ken Hancock and Fran Porter and begin working on social gatherings, film nights, and an event during that year's River Arts Festival and more. We were joined by members who were part of the Sexuality and Gender Alliance of Haldeman Norfolk, and our connections with the larger LGBTQ Two Spirit Plus community grew. And we worked to increase the scope of Haldeman Norfolk Pride Day to make it even a better, more inclusive event. On Saturday, February 10th, Pride Haldeman Norfolk, in partnership with Dunville's LVW Creative Barracks, prevented presented a very successful comedy night fundraiser called Queer and Present Danger. There were more than 80 people in the audience on a snowy cold night. The support from all sectors of our community was amazing. Several businesses donated silent auction prizes and others donated tickets for those who would not otherwise be able to attend. On May 26, 2018, we held the second annual Pride Day in Haldeman <coughs> County. The planning committee for this event was a core group, as I said, of 12 people who planned all year, fundraised, and promoted the event. Estimates for attendance were three to 400. Entertainment featured Danny Diamond, a Toronto performer and member of the LGBTQ Two Spirit Plus community who grew up in Caledonia, and Lacey Hill from Six Nations, also from the LGBTQ Two Spirit Plus community. Speakers included Bernie Corbett, Deirdre Pike, a politician and activist from Hamilton, and Erica James, a transgendered person who had recently run for municipal office in Brantford. Just as welcoming remarks finished at 1.30 p.m. that day, a wall of 11 men and four women carrying eight 12-foot tall signs appeared from Central Lane. An incredibly loud portable sound system amplified words of hatred and discrimination. The signs said things like, Jesus opposes your pride, repent, and Christ will come judge and rule, and liberal commies and homo fascists destroying Canada and our children. We later learned that these hate mongers came to Dunville from Ohio, California, and Arizona, from Hamilton and Toronto. Jesse Morrell, the little street preacher who attended the 2017 Pride Day event, was part of this group, having come all the way from Texas to meet up with his brothers in hate. They quickly lined up across the front of the bandshell stage effectively blocking half of the stage from view uh, for the event attendees while screaming at the children, seniors, and families assembled peacefully in Dunville's Central Park. They called your constituents pedophiles, whores, and sodomites, utilizing a military-grade portable sound system which was as loud, if not louder, than our permitted professional sound system. The agitators screamed at children, Gays are going to give you AIDS. One of, the ad, one of the agitators gave my daughter the middle finger while yelling, why don't you kill yourself? My amazing 22-year-old daughter lost her Uncle Blair, my little brother, to suicide in 2010 when he lost his decade-long battle with mental illness. This is just one small devastating example of the incredible trauma the hate mongers inflicted in your community. 
A woman with a young son in a wheelchair who lives with autism and Down syndrome was screamed at with, your child is like that because you are gay. This is not free speech. This is hate speech. And it absolutely traumatized many of the 350 to 400 people peacefully gathered in Central Park. So I'm going to just uh, pass around some, some photos. Um, you can see from the photos that the good people in attendance did a fantastic job of minimizing the impact of the hate mongers without any planning because we had no idea these paid imported agitators were coming. We reacted instantaneously, creating a buffer zone between the hate mongers and the local community, like a four foot wide buffer zone. Not much, but enough to keep the, the peace. That is crisis management 101 and it happened naturally. The hate mongers blocked the stage, so we moved off the stage and we gathered around picnic benches. OPP had arrived and they observed all this chaos while we kept the peace. We are the definition of badass. Uh, maybe that's the first time that's been said in this, these chambers. Probably not. I'm not going to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken, for that. There, there were so many things that could have gone wrong, and we did everything right. Nonviolent crisis intervention on a large scale right here in Haldeman County, specifically in Dunville. All of this goodwill didn't prevent community members from being traumatized, though but at least we did the right thing in a volatile situation. In the days that followed the 2018 Pride Day event, some of the hate mongers who attended the event caused a disturbance at the Haldeman County offices in Caledonia, and they threatened a Pride Haldeman Norfolk committee member in his residence at the Haldeman County long-term care facility, Grandview Lodge. And by the way, the agitators have posted photos online of themselves outside the county's Caledonia office and at the door of the Pride Committee members' residence at Grandview Lodge, and they have stated they will be back. I made a deputation to the Police Services Board on June 27, 2018, outlining what I and mother, many others considered an unhelpful, those are my gentle words, response by OPP officers who, who responded to the numerous 911 calls made as the paid hate mongers from Texas and Ohio and California and Arizona, from Hamilton and Toronto, descended on our little Pride Day event. I brought a few copies of my deputation and I have highlighted transcripts of some of the absolutely disgusting rhetoric that we heard at that event. It was brutal. On that day, amplified hate speech was screamed at the people who elected you. I'm just going to pass that around as well. At the Police Services Board meeting, I said it all out loud. It's pretty gross. Um, I'm also going to pass around. Oh, no, you've got that. So you can read for yourself the kind of garbage these hate mongers scream through their portable, unpermitted loudspeakers at your fellow community members that day in your central park. In the past year, much work has been done to heal to move forward, to raise awareness, thank you for passing that along by the way, to raise awareness and to build the capacity of this wonderful community. The Dunville Bridges Innovation Team presented a two-day facilitated anti-oppression workshop in the fall of 2018. Members of Pride Haldeman Norfolk have formed a support group for friends and family of, of people in the LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus community. This support group is part of a national network. That's called PFLAG, by the way. The work continues to this day. A complaint regarding the hate mongers' disruption of the 2018 Pride Day event and the police response to that disruption was filed with the Office of the Independent Police Review Director. The resulting 120-page report, they're usually about 30 pages, the resulting 120-page report is in the final review stage and we await its findings. OPP awaits those findings as well. At least two complaints were filed with OPP, and those complaints were followed through to completion. Haldeman County's Craig Manley and Linda Kisner have been very, very helpful, as our Pride Committee, now 30 strong, has been planning for the upcoming 2019 Pride Day event, which will be held in Dunville's Lions Park. We have had lengthy, challenging, and ultimately effective consultations with OPP Staff Sergeant Belinda Rose and Sergeant Jason Warner. 
We are grateful for the support they have offered and for the support of OPP Detachment Commander Phil Carter. Our Pride Committee has created a safety strategy to go along with a packed entertainment schedule, doing our best to ensure the enjoyment of the estimated four to 500 people, maybe more, who will attend the 2019 Pride Day event. We are Haldeman County. We care about each other, we support and we encourage each other. We create opportunities for our fellow community members to find their power. We carry on. As I stated in my deputation to the Haldeman Police Services Board, I would like to see the board and or Haldeman County create a community advisory group around diversity and equity with the goal of understanding discrimination and ending marginalization based on gender identity or sexual preference in Haldeman County. I can't believe that has to be said. If we want to build a better place to live and work, if we hope tourists will visit Haldeman County, if we want to encourage people to buy homes and start businesses here, if we want a vibrant, engaged community and economic development, we cannot stand by passively in the presence of oppression, discrimination, and hate. Do we have the courage to classify vile attacks against members of our community based on sexual or gender identity as hate crimes under the criminal code here in Haldeman County? And if not, why? Why not? These, th these types of things are being reclassified. Laws are being changed in other places in Canada. Are we a community that believes in human rights or are we not? If we believe in human rights for all, then let's give our OPP officers the authority to arrest, thank you, and charge these hate mongers. If you are asking yourself, what can I do as a citizen of Haldeman County to support the good work being done by Pride Haldeman Norfolk? Well, we've brought along buttons <laughs> that you are welcome to take and wear. We will gratefully accept cash donations for them, a loony or a toony. Every loony or toony helps. As individuals, also, you can make donations by check to Pride Haldeman Norfolk or via e-transfer to pridehn at hotmail.com. That's as individuals. Further to that, any public statement on social media or through traditional press outlets, thank you, supporting Pride Haldeman Norfolk by you as individuals is meaningful. Any public support of Pride Haldeman Norfolk by Haldeman County Council itself is also meaningful and helpful. In closing, your constituents from the LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus community experience stigma and, dis and discrimination throughout their lives and are targets of sexual and physical assault, harassment, and hate crimes. As a result of that, no wonder, the LGBTQ2 Spirit Plus people in our larger Haldeman community experience higher rates of depression, anxiety, suicidality, self-harm, and substance use. I will finish with a question. Are we a community that truly believes in human rights for all, or are we not? Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Bernie? Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for pr your presentation. Uh, several questions I have, and certainly a perspective from the Police Services Board to uh, you understand there are some issues that are still under review. I understand that uh, there are a complaint outstanding with the OPP, and we found through that exercise that everybody has rights. Mm -hmm. So with regard to that, I must apologize to you, and I've indicated that before. I will be uh, aware uh, Windsor on that particular date. Otherwise, I would be there to bring greetings from the county. Thank you, Bernie. That means a lot. And uh, several questions. There has been a change of venue. You can respond to that in just a moment. Uh, not only as a counselor, but chair of the Police Services Board, I'm concerned <coughs> with your group's safety and security. What is your group doing to ensure that we can pull that out without a, a similar incident to what we had last year? Well, as things stand right now, um, if the exact same thing happens, if similar things happen, OPP will stand by and watch. I think they're frustrated with that. I know our mayor is. Um, yeah, they will literally have the same response. They are hoping to get some direction from this, uh, this report from the uh, Ontario, I'm going to say it wrong, the 130-page uh, the, the report. They are hoping to get some direction from that or from, 
from on high, I guess, whatever their higher uh, authority is. Um, without uh, further direction that says, oh, you should or could have done this last year, they're going to do the same thing. At least we know that. And at least we can let people that attend the event know that because a large, some amount of the trauma was because people thought the cops are here. Now this is going to get, now these people who are screaming hate speech at us are going to have to stop. And a lot of the trauma was because they didn't have to stop and the, and the police just observed. We now know that's what they had the power to do there, apparently. We've, had, we've walked through scenarios with Linda Kisner and, and with, with Craig and with um, the two uh, OPP, uh, the Staff Sergeant Belinda Rose and uh, the Sergeant um, Jason Warner. We walked through all kinds of scenarios. What can we do? Most of it just gave us a couple more moments before, you know, whatever could hit the fan, you know? So we're, we moved to a venue that we hope at least we can, it's all fenced, mostly fenced. We're gonna have some rented uh, hurricane fence in some areas. We're gonna try and keep them from coming in. Um, we have some other strategies that I actually don't wanna say out loud because we don't want, hopefully these people don't show up. We have no idea, again, no indication that they're going to, but hopefully they don't show up. But if they're showing up, I would hate for them to be watching this and see what our, some of our strategy is. It's all legal, we've talked it all through with OPP and uh, so, uh, yeah. That's if I may, with that regard to the cordon off area, is there an indication if you cordon off a specific area, you can control who enters? On private property, yes. We were hoping, we were hoping that um, you know we care and control of the uh, Lions Park. Uh, if that care and control is is uh, in in our hands that we could say, oh, that person has to go. We, we talk through scenarios, uh, and it doesn't necessarily. So do you have anything to add to that? Because we, right. you were get, finding out some information. Thank you. Thanks, so Bernie. In, in recognizing what happened last year and trying to anticipate and uh, plan and uh, try to tr uh, do as much as we can to ensure that the community has a safe and uh, successful event, um, we have worked with the group, but we've also worked with the OPP and developed a strategy, some of which I, uh, if, if you want the details, I can do it in, in camera, but not out here. Um, we've also obtained legal advice on that strategy, so we know what we can and what we can't do. Um, the short answer is uh, we think we have a go forward that will enhance the opportunities for uh, a, a repeat of last year not to happen. But uh, you know, in the world of, of these things, there's no guarantees. But we're definitely in a different place than we were last year, both in terms of understanding it could happen, but also in, in terms of the types of steps that we can take to minimize it happening. And I can tell you in more detail what those are later. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Great. Any more questions for Rob? John? Just one. These people that travel from other countries <clears throat> that promote hate speech, is there not an admissibility to Canada at the borders, whether it be land crossing or, or at airports where they land? I know they've turned people away, uh, well, more maybe high profile people that, uh, that spew the same hate speech. Is there something in the works, maybe at the federal level that, uh, that be looked at? There are some things in the works. There are some people who are associated with the the people that came to our event who have been charged and prosecuted for hate crimes. Um, and I imagine, because that's, now that becomes a criminal code issue, I imagine they, would, they might have some difficulty coming across the border. As it is now, as has been said, uh, at this point, if it's not designated hate speech, and I think even that is still being talked about amongst the Crown, I believe, in, uh, in Cayuga. I don't think that's been, uh, Finalized. I think that's still a possibility, but I guess that's probably as much as I know about that. It would be it would be better if it if it was if these people could be charged with a hate crime. At least that would give some am ammunition for stopping them from coming across the border. There's still plenty of them in Toronto and a few in Hamilton, unfortunately, and a couple here locally who originally brought the the original lonely street preacher, you know, without amplification to the first event. <clears throat> 
Okay. Well, thanks, Rob, for being here and, and the rest of the gang for being here to support you. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to attend. As you know, I'm going to be busy uh, preparing for the gala, which is supporting the bridges this year. So it, yep. uh, uh, as much as I'd like to be there, the, this, this event and that gala seem to be consistent on the same day every yeah. year. So, yep. so something's going to have to change. We'll have to, we'll have to decide. Absolutely, we will coordinate. <laughs> but, but some of us will be at the gala yes. before and during and after. Uh, Good. So, and thank you so much Look for... Forward. Look forward to seeing you there. For including us in your, yeah. your little group there. It'll be fun. Okay. Well, have a great day, and I'm hoping that we'll keep our fingers crossed that everything works out well for everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you all. <clears throat> I need a uh, mover and a seconder that the correspondence and presentation material from Rob Lamoth, Haldeman Norfolk Pride Committee, update on 2019 Haldeman Norfolk Pride Day event, community activities be received as information. Councillor Corbett. Seconded. Councillor Lawrence, all in favor? That's carried. Our second delegate, uh, Andre Golubsing, who is with the Haldeman Huskies uh, Basketball Club, uh, is here to speak with respect to basketball programming in Haldeman County. Andre. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Thanks for letting me uh, appear here today on behalf of the Haldeman Huskies Basketball Club. My, as Mayor Hewitt said, my name is Andre Galabsing and I'm an executive member with the club. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of the clubs, to, on the club's behalf today to speak with you. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about our club. We are a non-profit volunteer-based uh, youth basketball club. We're an OBA affiliated and Canada Basketball Canada affiliated club. And for over 25 years, the Huskies have provided basketball skills development training, uh, house league and rep team teams for kids ages 5 to 18 in our communities. Uh, our club also sponsors and hosts an annual Craig Warren Memorial Tournament, which is in its 10th year for local elementary school grade 7 and 8 boys and girls teams. And we also provide other community basketball events. We have over 150 athletes from across Haldeman in the area registered in our programs. And I'd encourage you, if you're old like me, to follow us on Facebook, or if you are like the cool kids, you can be on Instagram and see what we're doing there. We don't do Twitter or Snapchat, because I don't know how. <laughs> um, our programs continue to grow, and we've made a number of changes to both our programs and our venue locations in order to accommodate these changes, but we still continue to experience scheduling challenges uh, with respect to access to facilities. Uh, attached to your agenda today is a link to an information report that was prepared and submitted by the club uh, for Council's consideration uh, regarding basketball programming needs in our community. And when the club saw that the county was uh, seeking community input on the potential location for a new recreation facility in the county, we thought this might be an opportune time to bring this information forward. So I hope you will try and find some time to review this information as your schedule permits. I'm not going to go through all of it with you uh, today, but we did want to make you aware of the demands and the popularity of, of the sport in our area and the need for quality, accessible indoor recreation space to support this activity. All of the detail and the rationale are set out in, in report, but in short, what we're asking is uh, if Council would consider incorporating a gym or an indoor recreation facility to the design and build plans for wherever you decide to locate this new facility. Um, and we hope that you'll receive this information from the club and consider incorporating our recommendations as part of the, ca the county's master plans for facilities and recreation development. So we're also realistic, I think, at the Huskies and, and realize that a project of this scope is going to take some sort of time to uh, provide assistance to us and the issues that are facing the club. And so while you consider this information and uh, our recommendations, I think there are some other ways that council could provide some assistance or support in the short term. And though the Huskies draw our athletes from across the area, what we found through our, our research is that the majority of our families and our athletes come from within a 15 kilometer radius of Caledonia. And I, I think that's not surprising given that historically the Huskies have used McKinnon Park Secondary School as our home gym for our programs. Uh, and 
We do that not just because of the geographic location and where our market is, but also because, quite frankly, McKinnon Park is the largest and best suited facility in the area for our needs. It has the greatest number of baskets, which lets us get the most number of kids in. It has storage uh, facilities for our equipment. And our parents and, and athletes have also indicated that um, quality appropriate facilities is one of their top two priorities when they're selecting minor sports programs and especially when it comes to basketball. And so one of the ways where we think that the council could help us is to use any influence you have with respect to your school board counterpart parts to help the Huskies get access to that McKinnon Park gym during school holidays. The community use of, of schools permit doesn't allow for that presently and the Huskies are very interested in accessing that space to provide camp style instruction, summer camps, March break camps, and I think there's a real need for that in our communities. <laughs> we also believe that since McKinnon Park is the only hardwood floor in Caledonia, it's really the only suitable space for our seniors to play basketball. And we think that sports like basketball and volleyball should be given priority access to those spaces and sports and activities that don't necessarily require a hardwood floor can use other community uh, facilities or school board facilities. So what we're here to ask is, is you know, in, in those types of regards, if there is a way that either the, the, the county could provide some sort of support or subsidy either directly or indirectly to the Huskies uh, to offset those increased permit costs and access to the school board or explore alternate ways that the county could support uh, the Huskies programs, I think that would be beneficial. We know that there is a demand and a need for these programs in our community, uh, both from a youth engagement perspective and a quality of life service to residents perspective. Um, you know, when we have one suitable space in our community that otherwise sits empty during school holidays and an organization that's willing to partner with the county to provide these services to the residents, you know, usually the Huskies define a win-win situation as when we beat you twice, but in this case, this is truly a win-win situation. Other ways that uh, the county could support community basketball is through some in-kind assistance or services to the club, and uh, things like I could see the county uh, potentially assisting us by accepting and administering registration to our programs through your online registration program for your recreation uh, programs that you have available now. Um, we would also benefit from the assistance of county recreation staff in advice and direction in a, a few areas. Um, whether they could provide support or facility support to have things like coaching certification clinics or officiating clinics. Um, and one area where we really struggle is in inclusion and participation of underrepresented groups. We could really use some professional expertise and strategy on how to attract more girls to the sport, how to attract more indigenous youth and underrepresented kids. Uh, to, the, to our programs. We have a, a, a real sort of drop off at about the grade four or five level we see with girls playing basketball and we'd like to see some strategies uh, to keep them in the sport longer. I know you are all busy. I know there's a busy agenda today. So I thank you for allowing me this time to speak to you on behalf of the Huskies. Uh, again, I hope you'll review the information and consider it and our recommendations in your deliberations when you're considering a new recreation facility. And I also hope that you'll consider our request for some other short-term assistance. Um, and I'd be happy to meet with uh, any of you or staff to discuss these suggestions further or in greater detail and subject to any questions. Mr. Mayor, those are the submissions of the club. So before I go to Danny, I'm just going to say, Andre, this is very well put together. Not surprised, um, but uh, yeah, very well, well done, well put together. So Danny? Um, yeah, fantastic, Andre. And <clears throat> you run a great program there like Thank you. over the years. Uh, because you're all listening to Mrs. Holtworth, right? So um, my son's been, and it's great. Um, with regard to the facilities, uh, like sp specifically MTSS, have you, um, as your group, have you approached the Grand Erie School Board and have they at least been open to at least listen, or is it just like, nope, this is it, done? So uh, I would say that the school board uh, staff that we've spoken to have been very helpful, or as helpful as they can be within the confines of the permit. Uh, and, and their community access policy. What's frustrating to us is, you know, we see things, we see their community use policy and then we see exceptions to the community use policy. And, and you know, policy can't cover everything. It's for the guidance of wise men and the obedience of fools. But then when we ask for the same sort of considerations that 
are being granted to other groups, we're told that that's not a possible arrangement. And, and it's difficult for us to understand why. So an example of that would be, you know, one of the, the priority items for us is getting access over March break and a couple of weeks through the summer holidays to run these camps. And they tell us, well, you can't do that because our policy doesn't allow for that. And yet we know and we see that they're running the same sort of programming and the same sort of camps at a school in Brantford. And when we ask why, we're told, well, it's because teachers are running that program. And when we ask, well, is it part of the curriculum? No, it's because they're employees of the school board. That doesn't seem right to us. You know, we've been a partner with this school board and provided these services for over 25 years. Surely you can trust us to be in there for a couple of weeks over the summer holidays and provide this service just like you trust your own employees to do this. So that's one good example. Um, another example, you know, when I, when I talk about giving the Huskies or, or other groups like gymnastics or volleyball that need access to that hardwood floor priority, they say, well, we can't give you an exclusive arrangement or priority access. And then when we ask them, well, why do you have that arrangement with the softball association for certain diamonds at your location? They say, well, because they provide us in-kind services and maintenance. And I say, we're happy to do that as well, but apparently those arrangements are difficult. So it, it's been difficult in that regard. Um, I'm going to the school board next week to make a similar pitch to them and see if we can't convince them to alleviate some of the bureaucratic concerns. But that's where our discussions are at with the school board. Okay. okay. And if I can be of any help. I appreciate that, Councillor. Be great to call me, Andre. Thank you. Barry? Yeah, thank you for reaching out to our community. To me, it's about 60 years too late, but thank you for reaching out. <laughs> we're, always looking for, we're always looking for players, Councillor. <laughs> I didn't know you were <laughs> that uh, our staff was nodding that you can get in touch with uh, them and speak to them mm -hmm. just trying to get some insight are the Raptors going to win this series listen you can't let those Sixers hang around for much longer right it's, it's got to get done soon but I, I think this is their year now if you want a detailed report on the state of U15 <laughs> Pool G OBL basketball I'll talk to you for hours about that already out of my leg <laughs> All right. Mayor, just a question. Do you, do you uh, have outdoor programs, summer programs? Beg your pardon? Do you, do you, do you make use of outdoor uh, summer? So we, we've just recently been holding some practices at the outdoor courts, um, and I've sent a request for some work to be done over there. There's a little bit of maintenance and some repairs that need to be done over there. Yeah. Well, you do make use of them? Yeah. Okay. And then the other question, uh, hardwood floor, obviously, Caledonia. Cuga doesn't have, it's a vinyl. C Cuga does, and we have used Cuga this past season for a number of practices as well. Um, and we're happy to continue to use other facilities, especially for our rep program to get there. But where we really need that access for McKinnon Park is our house league program is expanding. With the influx of residents to Caledonia, there's a lot more kids. And the time that we have there, we're only able to provide programming for about four teams right now. And we're, we know we're going to have at least six teams in each age division next year. So we're looking for more time in that regard well, as well. Would, would you do work out of both facilities? We'd like to keep our house league program in Caledonia at McKinnon Park because it's got the best facilities for the parents in terms of we can split the gym and there's two sets of bleachers and it's, it's just ideal for us there. We'll continue to use, we're using, uh, next year we're using Notre Dame and River Heights for our skills development program for our pups and our juniors, and we'll continue to use Cayuga for rep practices through the winter as well. Yeah. But there, there's still a need to get access to that space in McKinnon Park. Yeah, no, I, I, I see that. I'm just trying to think of just the expansion and make maximize the use out of, yep. out of public facilities. Okay. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> so I gotta need a mover and a seconder that the correspondence and presentation material from Andre Golobson, Haldeman Huskies Basketball Club, read basketball program in Haldeman County be received as information and that staff meet with Andre and his team to drill down deeper into the basketball development plan to develop strategies and recommendations whereby Haldeman County may play a role. Uh, Councillor Metcalf, Councillor Corbett, does that Direction suffice, Craig? Yeah, okay. Andre, where did Andre go? Oh, did, was that, that fine, that direction? So that we're gonna have staff contact you, meet with you and your team to, to look at the recommendations that you've made here, uh, share some possible ideas and some, some recommendations back to, to, to council as well as staff. 
where we might be able to participate and help out. Yeah. That's outstanding. I appreciate that. Okay. Pull on the school board. Yeah, yeah. We'll work with you on the school board as well. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? That is carried unanimously. Can we just clarify, Councillor Metcalf? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I'm just distracted here. Squirrel. Squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> so you moved it and voted for it. Well, well, I, I thought we were just voting on it. There you Apologize, go. No worries. We got you. Okay. So, uh, with respect to. Uh, with respect to the next report, there are three delegations yes. who would be speaking prior prior to the report. And the report has a closed aspect to it. I was going to say, it. there will be so a. There, yeah. We will likely end up going into closed mm -hmm. prior to coming back with a recommendation. That's correct. So uh, first uh, delegate is Roger Egger. Um, this is with respect to a unsolicited offer from Egger with uh, former rail lands in Dunville. Roger. Hello, Ken, Mayor and Councillors. Um, yeah, we've uh, been asked by other property owners along the tracks by our 85 Robinson Road property to look at purchasing the land back because of theft and damage to the property. So um, I researched it and found out that the town owns it and there's three deeds. And so I told them I'd go and put an offer in to purchase or if there's another way the council feels it should be done. But I really only want one piece at the end. And I don't see how we can do that without landlocking another piece. So. The last 20 years we've been there, we've spent well over 30,000 in security, continual theft, replacing fence being cut, uh, damages, and also insurance costs rising. Uh, right now we're spending about 6,000 a year just to maintain the surveillance we have. And uh, the police, every time they come, they say they cannot handle what's happening along there. So I just thought maybe I'd move forward and present it to council talking to other property owners that they all are facing the similar experience. I know that there uh, was a plan at one time for a rail trail, but um, I really don't see the benefit of it in that area because there's hunters, there's people out there doing things. I think it'd be very dangerous for a rail trail. Uh, where I see the other end of town that you've already sold off pieces and it's gone. So it's a very short, I don't really understand the rail trail dumping people on Highway 3. Uh, without, a, without really anywhere to go. So my proposal was as I put forth there to buy the one end or if you need to sell the whole thing, but I would really like to see all the land go back to the owners and we would like the one piece along to be attached. There's not wide enough for lots and I don't want a lot, but for our business, it would help us to grow. We do hire 20 people and we're aiming for 25 and we've been in business 33 years. So. Um, that's my reason for bringing it forward is I'm trying to solve a problem and also uh, we can expand. Good. Bernie? If I may, Roger, to get an idea, who utilizes that trail now? Is it quads, snowmobiles? Everything. There's turkey hunters in there right now. I actually put the lock and the, the chain on that gate. I also supplied the blocks to block people from going in. But that's not the issue. The prop, they're coming in from in on property, other people's property, trespassing, coming doing damage, and then coming down the trail to our place in that back corner. I can show you six places where it's been cut open. Um, gas, diesel's been stolen, equipment's been stolen. It's just expensive. I don't think it's fair. I don't think the land is doing anything there. I think it could be better used by the property owners, and it takes the responsibility off the town. And secondly, is it a trail to nowhere? Do you know of the section on the west side of number three highway is open or is it sold? I, I believe it's privately owned. So it was the sold off. trail would terminate at number yeah. three. Yeah. And then the other thing is, is if people are crossing it, property owners, I mean, there's also that issue. <clears throat> if you've got people on there, let's say biking or walking, if that was the plan, what about these four wheelers coming in from anywhere? So I don't, I think you got a real safety issue making it a trail. Um, I understand the piece coming down from Thompson Creek into that Ducks Unlimited. I think that's a neat idea and it's a good spot for a trail. But this side, 
to the other road, I think there's a lot of liabilities. Yep. Okay. Any other questions for Roger? No. Thank you, Roger. For, Thank you for making some clarity. Uh, so is it Frank and Dennis are speaking on the same? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. The same report. So Frank, you've been e quietly waiting since 9:30 oh, this, this morning. Oh, this is very interesting. You know, I get to see how big uh, big town works. Um, I guess uh, Mayor. Good afternoon, Mayor. Collie or councillors and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm originally, my family owns about 90 acres of property that is intersected with the rail trail. And the uh, part of the rail trail that um, Roger's looking to buy ends right at my, my property line. Well, actually a little bit inside my property line. Um, the, I guess the town of Dunville sent a uh, letter to me and I uh, had only two days to respond. So being really quick, I didn't know what was happening. So I got my sol solicitor to look into it. And uh, originally I, I objected to it because I have issues with um, landlock. I don't want to have our land uh, landlock. And I believe same with uh, many of the other owners uh, express the same concerns. Uh, there are other concerns also. I, I went and canvassed everybody uh, once I had some time to see what's going on here. Um, I had let my solicitor, you know, just uh, tell the, the uh, town that I'm willing to wait to see what happens here. I canvassed the other um, owners, landowners, and I also talked to Roger. And I do agree with him in the fact that uh, there's been a lot of vandalism. Uh, there's uh, theft. I actually had some theft on my property. Um, others uh, have issues with their livestock. Uh, one of the other landlords had some livestock that got damaged, uh, got actually killed. And so I'm certain to agree that uh, maybe the best thing would be to, to uh, sell that property to Roger. Um, originally I protested it because of uh, the lack of time to look into the matter, but as I looked into it further, I, I realized it's more of an issue. And there isn't really anywhere to walk there except on a trespassing. I mean, Highway 3 is on one side and, and uh, Robinson's on the other. And we've had some issues there. So um, the only issue I have is that I have a uh, registered right of way across there. I would like to ensure that that right of way remains intact, unaltered, so that I can get my equipment and stuff there across you know, both parcels of land that you know, stretches across the uh, rail line, the, the formal rail line. Okay. Um, other than that, uh, I think the property that's on the west side, uh, it hasn't been yet up uh, posted for sale. And I believe that the, there's a, like a, consor a consortium of um, landowners that wouldn't, would be interested in purchasing that. So okay. uh, I, I spoke to all of them and they're all in agreement. Okay. Great. So other than that, if there's any other questions. Like questions to Frank? So I take it from your comments, you're in support of Rogers. I, yeah, right? I've, okay. uh, I've, after I had a chance to look into the matter further, I, I'm in support. We won't call you Dalton McGinney, but we'll say that you've flipped around a bit. I'm flipping. Okay. <laughs> but, but I had an excuse. I only had one day, two days no, to prepare fair. and get my that's solicitor and, and everything involved. No problem. Great. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you everyone. Here. And Dennis. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you, Mayor, Councillors, for uh, hearing me out. This is not something I do very often, so. But uh, I have, our issues uh, are a lot the same. There has been damage there. We actually uh, own 250 acres that is split by the tracks. And... Uh, so that railroad uh, line beside Rogers, Mr. Akers, uh, over the years, for 20 some odd years, I've kept it clean. I mow it every year. Um, with Rogers' uh, help, we have worked uh, to maintain the gate, the lock. Um, and so it's been very handy as farmers for us because 
it, not only does it provide access to those to the back, it's the only feasible way of access into, into the fields on the north side of the tracks, or what used to be the tracks. Um, it keeps us uh, from dragging a lot of mud on the road, unfortunately, from time to time, we can't avoid that. And we try to stay off the Highway 3 because our property goes right out to the highway. So for half the land, at least, we can access it through that track. So while it makes me, it would be a detriment to, to lose that, at the same time, I understand Roger's plight. Um, uh, there, there, there is a, a damage there. Um, so we've tried very hard to keep it clean over the years so that we could, so we, we could pass that, uh, go down there. And uh, of course, we do have an access across. It's a very poor one. Had we lose that, then we've ha we'd have to put some money into you know, being able to cross the tracks where that access uh, is, but it's very difficult uh, at the time. So, and without that, of course, we're totally 125 acres landlocked. So that's, that's a huge concern for us. We do have damage uh, where ones um, go in there with four wheelers, uh, they run through the crops, and I don't, I don't know whether that's gonna stop that because they, they tend to find a way somewhere. Um, a lot of these young ones uh, live in town and I guess that's their way of going down there. So we've kept the, the tracks clean up to the edge of our property. When you get past ours, it gets very difficult uh, to go through there anymore. The trail is pretty well obsolete, it's gone. <clears throat> past that point. The other issues that would come into play as well would be the fact of um, drainage. You know, um, if that was taken out, uh, it would have to be looked at as to how that land would drain so that, of course, it wouldn't just all back up on our property as well. So d just a few um, issues there that, that we're looking at. Uh, we, if that's the case, that you would decide that the property could be acquired. Of course, we would like to acquire that section in between there. Uh, it would be returning back to the original property that uh, would make it once, it once again whole. Right. So that would be very important uh, to us as well. Um, I think at this point, I've said all I can say. Okay. <laughs> Questions to Dennis? No? John? Yes. Um, I'm familiar where Edgar's is on the Robinson Road. So how far, I guess, from my perspective, it would be how far north would, like, I guess you're at the third property in, would you be? Um, how close to Highway 3 would your property be from the Robinson along that stretch there? Well, it, it comes from Highway 3. There's 125 acres in front of the tracks. Our property, um, yeah, I'm trying to think now whether, I don't exactly know how far Rogers goes back whether um, Roger could probably fill you in, whether Alex Cowan, he's in there, whether he has a little piece in there, I'm not exactly sure if it goes to the tracks. Does he, Roger? Uh, or does yours butt up with mine? Uh, yeah. In any event, I'm very, just about butt up to the back of Roger's. And then it goes, it actually was two farms originally years ago. Uh, and it goes just about all the way to Evergreen Point uh, and then straight back. It's quite a... So it's a pretty significant... It's a big piece chunk, of, yeah. piece of that trail anyway that would be... Yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. Dennis, and I'm sure you and Roger have talked as well as, you know, in the, in the event that this is to take place at how, how everyone can maybe work well, work together to try to keep the status quo with, without... Uh, or not without, but, but accomplishing the goal, hopefully, of eliminating the, the vandalism that occurs on, the, on that site. You've had some conversations. Yeah, we've, yeah. Like, we've worked together, and yeah. like Roger, uh, I had a lock on it before and a chain, and they just kept cutting it. And cutting it. So Roger says, I got a chain, they won't cut. <laughs> and they haven't. So, uh, yeah, it's been, that's been good. Okay, good. Well, thank you for being here, Dan. Thank you. Um, so as, as mentioned, uh, Roger, just and the rest of you for your per understanding. So what's going to happen is, is that we have a closed report. Typically when there's a land acquisition, 
Uh, staff will make some some uh, comments and information regarding that, and we're going to close with respect to to uh, land, and and then we deliberate. We come back out of close. So you're more than welcome to to wait. We don't go into close till the end of the day, uh, but if you choose to rather get out and enjoy the rest of the day, which I'd suggest, um, then we will uh, staff will notify you as well as the neighbors. Uh, on on steps to the next process and where we go from there because it yeah. will so, it'll so get passed today one way or the other and then it gets ratified at council. So I'm good either way. If you guys, if the town wants to sell each piece back to those that want it, or if you want one person to buy it, that's fine. And then I would sign any letter saying it's going back before. But I, I don't want that other property. And you're comfortable with um, with amongst yourselves working some kind of easement arrangement so that those that, uh, for instance, Dennis can get across to get oh, to, yeah. to the land. Yeah, so. like I mean, same with the drainage. There yeah. has to be drainage there. There has to be a tile or something. The ditch has to be remain. Yeah. Because the back of our property will flood out too. Yeah, I guess, so. Mr. Mayor, it, it, we'll probably not get it. So if if council decides that they're looking at. Um, getting rid of the property and not keeping it in as the as what was planted in the uh, the county then we'll probably look at the report and then maybe have direction to staff to come out of it because mm -hmm. what you don't want to get into is you know if if you choose that route you don't want to sell portions of it and have it landlocked and have it no you, yeah and so you know you want to no, no, no. i have done the research and, so, and uh i had several come to me at the other end who want their property they just didn't know how to go about it, so I right. just took it on myself because I was interested in stopping the other yeah. problem. Okay. Okay. So information will be brought forward to you in the next next couple of days. Bernie knows where to find me. Bernie will find you. <laughs> oh. Hi, my name is Rick Allison. I'd like to have a little input on this too. My property both is on both sides of the trail too, and I have four acres on one side. All of a sudden, that 42 acres that I have to go to out the back will, could become landlocked unless we buy it if some so this is why and this is where all the trouble comes from the trouble comes from our three that are down at a laneway that's where everybody comes in from I've had my house broken into twice I've had chickens killed by people's dogs walking their dogs on the trail two or three in the morning on a Saturday night if you go down there you'll see you'll see quad tracks and that out our backyards digging up our trails and I have to go in and fill these trails in so I can get back out into my back area so it's very frustrating yeah. and so when you've nothing you can do I think I think what we've got here now is we've got some clarity as to there's th the sense of the problem and so I think what we're going to do is we're going to have staff uh, get some information for us we're also going to give them direction to come back I think that a meeting with all of you is in that particular area is two steps forward to solve the problem. Rogers made a recommendation in terms of you know purchasing that piece, but as you say, you know not just one. It has to inquire. It has to have everybody in the same. We all own both sides of the track. All of us owners along there own both sides, so I don't so, see how it can be too complicated. Yeah. So for us, it's our intent to solve the problem. We don't want to create a bigger problem. So I think I, I think that's where we'll move from. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay, we're we're okay. we're Holdeman we're, we're kind of follow we're kind of breaking rules here. So, well, Haldeman County Trail Master Plan and Partnership, with the Ontario Trails Council. So you've already Haldeman County already spent money and time doing a plan. Yes. And all of our issues were already addressed in that plan, and it was also stated what would have to be done to the trail that was never done. And this is 2009. So 10 years later. Our section of the trail has only ever been used by vandals and dog walkers. It was even suggested in there that ATVs be banned. The grade of the trail is not such that it's compatible with bicycles. So I'm, I'm just, I've, I wanted to tell you about that because you already did the legwork for yeah. that plan. Yes. So yeah. a lot of your questions could be. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Just a motion to receive the three pieces of correspondence. So I need a mover and a seconder that correspondence from the following individuals. Report LSS 1619 unsolicited offer from Egger, former rail lands in Dunville be received as information with respect to both one, two, three, Roger, Frank, and Dennis. Moved Corbett, seconded. Ed Calf. These guys are asleep over here today. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, you liked it that way. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Uh, questions, comments on the minutes, Police Services Board, page 174. I'll move the report. You second it? Yep. Nothing? All those in favor? Just a question. Oh. Well, I asked that. Just a question. I know you told us, I think, last meeting, who's, what's the name of the provincial appointee? I forgot when I went to tell somebody. Carrie Boone. Thank you. Oh, Carrie Boone. Carrie. Oh, I thought you said Harry. Carrie. Oh, okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Related, but not. Yeah. <laughs> That's Carey carried Carey. unanimously. Probably comes carried, carried. Uh, There's no unfinished business, new business. Page 181. So this is the first motion. Okay, this is, uh, I'll read this motion. Well, let me get a mover in a second. I assume in Councillor Corbett. Seconded. This is uh, with respect to Councillor Corbett's motion. Uh, every moment, oh, every moment counts campaign. Uh, it is a uh, a request for funding for uh, Dunville Hospital. So I need a seconder. Lawrence. So I'll read this out. Whereas Haldeman County has previously approved a one-time grant of seven hundred thousand to the Haldeman War Memorial Hospital. And whereas the Haldeman War Memorial Hospital has directed these funds to be applied to new equipment and furnishings for a redeveloped emergency department, and whereas the members of the Dunville Hospital and Healthcare Foundation made a delegation to Council and Committee to update Council on the status of fundraising efforts for the redeveloped emergency department and to request a financial donation from Haldeman County of 100 to 150,000 to meet their fundraising target of a minimum of $3 million. And now, therefore, be it resolved that Haldeman County provide a one-time donation to the Dunville Hospital and Healthcare Foundation of 150000 towards their Every Moment Counts campaign for the redeveloped emergency department, and that this one-time donation be funded from General Reserve Fund in the fiscal year 2019, that a letter from the Mayor's Office together with a copy of this resolution be sent to the Minister of Health and the Hamilton Niagara Haldeman Brandt Local Health Integration Network advising Haldeman County's one-time donation and requesting enhanced provincial financial assistance to this municipality, local hospitals, to ensure their continued viability given the importance of this service to the community. Councillor Corbett. Yeah, I spoke to this uh, before when I brought the motion forward. As you know that the hospital is our number one employer in the community. I'd like to see it to remain sustainable. The fact that the ER has come on with the increased uh, opportunity to serve people now comes more to the fore as we see uh, other ERs in the Niagara region closing. And I think it's money well spent and a show <coughs> of our support for, for the hospital. Um, Mr. Mayor, in the past, there'd be other councillors around this table who, who would say that because we're doing, contemplating making this donation to Dunbar War Memorial that we, we'd have to do and should do the same for um, West Haldeman at the other end of the county. I've never been a proponent of that. I've, I've always thought that... Um, um, we should be more strategic, and I and I do think that the municipalities have a role to play because, as Councillor Corbett said, the hospitals uh, in those two communities are, are not only vital to Dunville and Hagersville, uh, but they serve the entire county, and we're very blessed to have two in our county. Um, I I think we should be more strategic. I think when the hospitals approach us, and I guess I would put council on notice that some sometime down the road. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, there's going to be a major announcement out of West Haldeman General Hospital in terms of, of a major rebuild that would help service that end of the county uh, better than it does today, uh, that I'd be coming back to this council. I will come back to this council and uh, request that, that we be um, a participant in that and perhaps, perhaps help uh, kick off the campaign. So. 
Uh, I'm not going to sit here today and say that if this council chooses to make this donation to Dunville that we should have to turn around and make it to Hager's. I, I don't believe in that. I think we should be more strategic and methodical in our approach. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just going to add to that. And I, I, I think that we should be more strategic, uh, but I also think that we need to define uh, you know, where our role starts and stops. And, and, and I certainly believe that the hospitals do provide a tremendous valued service in, in, in the county. Um, you know, but when we set our priority sessions, we set our priority sessions with the nine cents on every dollar that we collect from property tax to, that we have the ability to choose to allocate across the county. And within those nine cents, uh, you know, um, health care is not one of them. And, and it's not to say that it's not an important role, but it doesn't fall in that category. And so if we're going to just on the fly start looking at contributing to different fundraising efforts, I think it puts us in a very precarious position in determining, you know, which ones are we going to choose, which are the winners and which are the losers, because we, 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 we you know, we, we don't have really any specific policy or practice in place. And that's where I see the challenge with, with this. I know that uh, years ago, um, Councillor Delamonte and Councillor Boyko came forward with uh, a recommendation uh, because of the vibrancy funds, and, and, and it was decided to, to allocate those funds uh, uh, to to the hospital, uh, we we at that point in time we, we actually it, we yeah. well no we we did fund and so the request that we just received we actually have already funded the hospital for the exact same thing the emergency right. department this is coming from another arm of the same exact same project but those funds that we took were from the um, social services arbitration award and so both hospitals received the best part of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars each. Uh, the, for the Dunville Hospital, it was for this project, the emergency department, and for uh, the uh, uh, Halibut War Memorial or the, the Hagersville Hospital, uh, it was for a, a project and equipment that they were looking for at that time. But the funds came from the social uh, the arbitration. Right, that's right. Because it started out as this, it's, it's yes. my mistake. It started out as the CVF, and then we moved it from arbitration. Yeah. So I guess in long and short of it is I, I, my, my concern is just not having it within our priorities, certainly within our mandate, or having a policy to speak of. It makes it very difficult to support. But Councillor Lawrence? Um, I, I totally agree with what your, your concerns are, um, Mr. Mayor and Councillor Dalmani. The one thing that I, uh, comes to mind, especially is the need for health care and the growing need for it and the downloading and what we're seeing from the province. And we have these great healthcare facilities within the county that, that service us and we don't wanna lose them. And if we can aid them, um, I think that we have to really overturn every stone we possibly can to fund them, to help them. Um, yes, we do need a plan. You can't just keep pulling things out of thin air because I don't think that that's, uh, uh, that's wise and that's not good planning on, on overall. But um, with regard to our hospitals, we need to look at every avenue that we possibly can to make sure that they continue to survive and actually get better. And looking at what Dunville's done, I, I think it's great things. And yeah, that could happen very soon here with uh, West Haldeman, maybe in the near future. Um, but they do service our communities and we need that. So I think that we have to be aware of that more than anything. That if we can keep these going and keep improving them, um, that should be a priority of ours. Corbett? Yeah, I understand uh, what you're saying, Your Worship, but I can tell you that uh, this rebuilding of the ER has tremendous support from our community, and I think if you took it to the public, they would agree that this is where we should put some money. Well, and I... I, I <laughs> We just put 700,000 in there. I guess I, I agree, I, I, but again, as I say, where does it start and stop? I, I, I'm, not in, I'm not against the idea of supporting our hospitals, but we have a body, uh, a government body that collects tax dollars from the public for Ministry of Health, 
and that's what mandates and manages our, our hospital care across the province. If we start stepping in and doing that with taxpayers' dollars, property taxpayers' dollars, we're, we're, we're admonishing their responsibility to be providing that service that they're committing to. Um, and so uh, that that's becomes, I guess, the challenge for me in terms of supporting it. I support philosophically our hospitals wholeheartedly. I just I have a hard time with, with the idea of, of a supporting a program we've already supported, but also not having any kind of policy or anything that, that gives us something to, to stand on to be able to prohibit others from coming in and asking for funding because the Ford government decides today they're going to shut down this particular arm or they're going to cut back on that particular arm. We're already hearing from, from Councillor Delamani and social services and all the cutbacks and all the different uh, so services that we already are committing dollars to that are that are only 75 cent dollars that yesterday were a dollar 100% uh, dollars so where is it where does that end and that's without a policy we are we are running down a very slippery slope by just pulling uh, funds out and saying we're going to support this fund raising idea because it's a good idea and it's well supported by the community I can't argue that but I I can't also be able to support it from the perspective that there's not enough uh, teeth in a policy to protect it. So that's 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 not not that I don't support the idea, or certainly the hospital in itself. But anybody else on this? Can I, can I just clarify that uh, I've been provided with the correct wording? It should, the one-time dono donation would be funded from the contingency reserve rather than the general, general reserve, okay. if that's the correct word. So wording. funded from contingency. <clears throat> Agree to the amendment. I think, through you, Mr. Mayor, I think, you know, if council wishes to fund hospitals, that maybe in next year's cap in next year's operating budget, we add on a 1% uh, tax increase and, and give half a percent to each of the hospitals on an ongoing basis, because that's a, a, essentially what you're doing here. And so you might as well call it what it is and get the recognition for it and tax for it as you, as you move forward. Then you have a regular plan. You can give away $300,000 a year to whatever you'd like to for the hospitals and, and know that it's coming from the property tax base because that's what you believe in. I wouldn't disagree with that, but we're dealing with this issue now. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? That is carried five to one. Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, second draft motion. Yeah, that uh, 2019 capital budget be revised uh, to include 6,000 as a contribution to the Hagersville Firefighters Association for the purchase <coughs> of electronic sign funded by the Community Vibrancy Fund Ward 4 allocation to be placed on the Hagersville Fire Station property subject to all necessary approvals being obtained. Mover. Money seconded. Councillor Lawrence, uh, pretty self-explanatory. I don't think there's much discussion in it. All those in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. And this is. Uh, Councillor uh, Delamani, that staff be directed to report back to council on the routing feasibility and cost of alternate east-west truck routes around Hagersville. Seconded. Mr. Corbett. Councillor Delamani, you've already kind of spoken on it earlier, but. Yeah, I guess it'd be best to wait till the report comes back from staff. And uh, I mean, they, they know what the issues are as well as I do. I'm just tired about reading about it in the press. I, I, well, I will, I, I guess if I may just add, I, I did get a call. I'm sure you spoke to uh, a local trucking company uh, around the corner from, from you. Um, I think the, the sense, at least from what I was given, that the general concern of truck traffic or coming from the down King Street West and making that turn 
is all stemming from one in one particular company uh, out of uh, Nell's Corners. I'd say not the lion's share. Ninety percent of those trucks coming are coming from uh, from the from the the, the, the mill, the, the bird feed mill, and and so I'm wondering before we, or not necessarily before we do it, but as part of this uh, feasibility, that might maybe be a conversation with the owner of that uh, enterprise that that may be part of their uh, strategy is to prevent their trucks from going into Hagersville, making that right down down on onto a, uh, Highway 6 because they're the ones that, uh, and it was their truck actually, that, or that truck or their company's truck that was in that accident that uh, caused the, caught that car. So it, that might cause or take some of the, uh, it might not take all, but certainly a good chunk of it out of the, uh, the argument, but, but I think we, as we're looking at the costs and, and alternate routes, maybe we should be also looking at where are the source of these trucks coming from and what are the options that we could do within uh, that doesn't necessarily require so much hard, hard dollars. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I'll, I'll leave it to staff to, yeah. to, to come up with a report, but you know, it, it's just, it's gotten to the point where these incidences are occurring way too often and too frequently. And we're absorbing some of the trucks that are coming out of the Brantford area that are, instead of using the 403, have discovered that County Road 20 is a quick route to Highway 3 to get themselves down to the Niagara region for one reason or another. And just after the incident that you just described, Mr. Mayor, the very following week, there was just about somebody run over at that corner who was in a uh, uh, accessible motorized vehicle. Uh, if it wasn't for somebody running up behind this woman and pulling her and the vehicle out of the way, we could have had a pretty serious incident. There was, there was a Hagersville firefighter who was at the intersection and saw the whole thing happen. That intersection was never designed for those type of truck turning movements. So, you know, at the risk of being repetitive, let's wait. But I agree with yeah. you 100%. I, the more companies we can get a hold of and make them aware of what we're attempting to do here, the better. Well, yeah, and I think specifically, I, I'd like to know in this report is is of the trucks. What what is their, their, their what are their routes like? Where are they? Are they and where is their origins? You know, coming and and leaving to because I think Tyson, that's going to to help us identify because we we might be able to control some of this without having to expand a lot on infrastructure if we can control it with just human behavior and 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 forcing you know not forcing but working with the companies that are doing business locally to change maybe some of their habits, assuming that is the problem. And if it's not, then that'll come out in terms of that conversation. All those in favor? That's carried unanimously. Oops, sorry, wrong paper. So it's moved, or I need a mover. Actually, this is Councillor Medcalf's motion. So I need a seconder that staff be directed to report back to Council and Committee on the regulation of flyer distribution, including options and best practices from other municipalities. Council Corbett. Comment? Yeah, just speaking on it, uh, I know they used to, these flyers used to be delivered uh, by hand and put in people's mail mailboxes. When I, when I see them littering the street all over the place and uh, people calling me about them, that they're, they're littering in a sense because they're just thrown on a driveway and then you get into the winter time where you get the people operating their snow machines and then it gets caught up in their gearing and they uh, bake a shear bolt on that. So, uh, uh, he's got a picture of what's going on. It creates a mess and they shouldn't be permitted to do this, just to throw the flyers out and on our property really, because they don't win far enough to the people's property. I think it's something we should take an initiative at and make sure that uh, 
something is done about it. Actually, I don't know why something can't be done now. We've got littering bylaws that we couldn't enforce them. Okay. Well, we'll wait for the report. Different ideas from from uh, from from other uh, municipalities, John. I just have just random photos that I took just driving around the village, and um, if I could hook into the <clears throat> laptop, I could show you. But there's two and three weeks worth of flyers that are down in ditches, and they are in plastic bags, and they they clog up the the culverts and things like that. And again, I've had a couple complaints this winter of. Um, it was snow blowers and shear pins and machines broke, uh, those type of things. Uh, some flyers are delivered right onto the door, and I don't have a problem with that. It's the ones that maybe are thrown from cars that miss their mark and wind up being in ditches yeah. and on the roadways <coughs> and not picked up so they can't get it. Ever. All in favor? That's carried. Anyway. <clears throat> this one's uh, John again. Staff be directed to prepare a brief for consideration during the review of draft 20 tax support capital budget on the purchase of additional electronic speed warning signs. Councilor Corbett. All those in favor? Well, a question. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I got a too. <laughs> oh, go you go ahead. Seconder. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Are we are we talking here about the uh, devices that simply flash the speed, or are we talking about the other uh, device that actually um, me know. measures and reports back to the OPP on? My understanding was it was the the ones that flash the speed. The ones that flash. Ones like you're going into Selkirk, going into Kohler. Just okay. to remind you your speed. I, I okay. I, I mean, I'll, I'll certainly re support having the motion brought back, but I really think that we need to have some discussion about allocating further money towards those devices. The other ones that measure and report back, I think we're getting our money's worth. But quite frankly, on some of the, on the other ones, some of the other ones that we put, it's become a game. It's become a game. If you, stay, if you sit at any length of time and watch some of these devices and watch the traffic that's going by, I'll tell you, it's become a game. Some of them are going by to see how, how high they can run up to speed. I, I wonder, I have to wonder after the discussion I had with the OPP detachment commander about whether or not we would be better off investing our money in photo radar as from some strategic locations in the urban yeah. area. Let's I'll, save I'll, that. I'll stop there at that discussion, yeah. but I'll support the motion for the, for the report. Okay, uh, uh, is, it, is it on this or something new? Because we're just going to move on. We're, we're going to wait for the report, and then we can kick this to the can. The only thing <laughs> I, I would ask is, in my mind, I thought we already had a, a plan in place that Karen found the money that we would go two a year and uh, if we're talking about other devices then we need may look at another additional portable i, I think we are looking at food or radar for uh, Hagerville. yeah I, I don't think there's money in the budget i think this this would be a new initiative for new fund and new monies this would be for more of those speed sides yeah, yeah i mean you could do it if you want to contingency reserves right yeah i mean you could just you know, go into the into the into the piggy bank if that's if that's you know if you want them now yeah. or at any point. Yeah. Yeah. With regard to that, does that have an attached to it any specific number per ward? Like no. This is or, or just flat out. Just this is just a. We'll this is just whether we're going to yeah. buy some. So the, per basically, ward. it'll be a it'll be a unit cost, and and it'll come into budget saying here's how much they are and the how budget. many do you want, or how many do you not want. Right. Okay, John. On that, uh, Councillor Delmont, I didn't know there was another type available that records the speed, so that might be an issue as well. We'll wait for the report back. I was just familiar with what is out there now. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? That's carried. Really. Oh, yeah. 
Any inquiries, announcements, or concerns? John. I have one announcement that I was involved with the Cuga Cares cleanup uh, on Saturday, an initiative brought uh, forward by the Cuga Chamber of Commerce. Uh, 85 volunteers showed up Saturday morning for a village cleanup and I guesstimate between two and 300 bags of garbage, refuse, and uh, yard waste was, was cleaned up throughout the town. Also, uh, a lot of uh, landscaping was done at the gazebo in the village green around the existing library down by the river, the Cuga Kin Hall and Ballpark and Riverside Park all had landscaping done and kudos to the uh, Cuga Chamber of Commerce and the the vision that was Cuga Cares that was put out, uh, their, their committee that organized it, well organized and also uh, kudos to staff for getting all of the bags and um, gear ready, the gloves and uh, equipment needed to, uh, to carry it out that was uh, well received and a lot of positives. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else? It, unfortunately, it doesn't, it, it doesn't work procedurally. He really whipping that community. Oh, no, I had his hand up to speak. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. <laughs> Anything? Uh, I will say that uh, uh, last uh, Monday I was in Toronto. I met with the Minister of Transportation. A um, number of discussions that were to, there. Uh, the, the main uh, conversations was uh, relating to the um, reconstruction and uh, the bypass uh, resurfacing projects. The um, conversations that we had were um, very much at a high level, but were very clear that, uh, that there needed to be some more engagement with uh, the local municipality as well as uh, those on Six Nations and to, to ensure that those projects are, are are met in a timely manner and done in a way that uh, everybody will be able to support. Uh, I also spoke to the minister uh, regarding a couple of uh, projects that uh, we felt uh, would be worth uh, paying attention to. Um, one was the uh, Highway 6, six line uh, interchange as we uh, continue to move forward with the arterial road, uh, the ring road on the back side of Caledonia and directing traffic uh, out towards uh, Argyle Street. Um, we believe that there's some value in moving traffic across Argyle Street down 6 line and having a straight interchange onto the bypass uh, at that area which would uh, direct traffic to the north side uh, of Caledonia in a much more expeditious manner. Um, it was well received and uh, we will be providing more information with them on that. The other uh, conversation we had and we're meeting, we're following up with a meeting with the uh, senior policy <clears throat> analysts with the Minister of Infrastructure and that's the Hagersville to Caledonia water main. Uh, um, knowing that uh, we have support of uh, both New Credit and Six Nations uh, and our ability to connect Caledonia to Hagersville and giving us the option to, to, to get off of the city of Hamilton water, but also providing a trunk line down Highway 6, which would then allow um, for the intake of water uh, from Lake Erie onto Six Nations and New Credit, which would certainly serve their populace but much better than it currently is today. And the other project was the, um, uh, the final phase of the Highway 6 connection, which is the uh, connection from Mount Hope uh, near air the airport to the bypass of Caledonia on the north side. And that we believe with the ongoing uh, construction as well as uh, um, our drive to see the industrial park and the rest of the north end of Caledonia continue to, to develop. The need for that, uh, that final phase of that bypass uh, is, is, is eminent and that the sooner that they can start the, the uh, earlier stage processes to get going on that, it would be to everyone's benefit. Again, it's, uh, they've asked for some more information and I believe we'll be arranging for staff to meet with their senior policy and analysts. Um, 
and the uh, other comments that came out of that conversation one was the uh, the rationale behind the rumble strip down the center line and why we were having some pushback in getting that completed uh, frankly there was some shock amongst uh, amongst them all uh, in that room that uh, they didn't seem to think it would be a challenge and that we should be able to accomplish that goal so uh, I've asked Tyson to send me the information and we'll be sending that back to them for for the request and finding out why if there's some reason that it uh, some argument that doesn't support it but we can't come up with or couldn't come up with any at the time and lastly at the, at the very same time we were uh, getting information from uh, from Councillor Del Monte and uh, and staff regarding the um, uh, development in Hagersville and uh, one of their commitments is that they're currently reviewing uh, how they manage uh, egresses and, and, and access points onto uh, connecting link highways that fall within the urban boundary of our communities. And so currently there's a policy where they take uh, ownership and, and control over how uh, that is developed, which makes it very challenging for Tyson and his group to, to support uh, different initiatives and projects where we believe it makes sense and then we get uh, pushed back from the MTO. So, so there's, uh, there seems to be a general consensus around that uh, group that uh, uh, there's a lot of things that we, they think we can do uh, certainly in a, a better, more uh, uh, manageable way than what it was in the past. Uh, they want to see the success of uh, obviously the bypass of bridge and as well as the Caledonia bridge. And I've made it, uh, relatively clear or very clear to them that uh, for that to happen there needs to be more more engagement here locally uh, with the uh, the different uh, different groups that uh, continue to exist out in Six Nations and that number of these projects uh, albeit these are just some there might be a few more but uh, certainly these projects that would provide support to those uh, groups out there would uh, certainly bode well and, and position them well for for them to complete the uh, the Caledonia Bridge, so I'll uh, I, I am following up with the the uh, their staff, and I'll keep you abreast as I hear more. But uh, that's uh, that was it was a good meeting. We had just a little over an hour with them in Toronto, so it was good. <clears throat> Anything else? Seeing none. So we had three items listed on on the closed agenda. There's only one right now related to the unsolicited offer from Mr. Egger. Um, but I just wanted to know, is there, an, is there an interest in adding an additional item about security of the property related to the um, Alderman Norfolk Pride Day event or, or to leave that for now? I don't think so. Okay. So. so a mover and a seconder that pursuant to Section 239 of the Municipal Act is amended. Council convened a meeting at uh, 2.34 p.m. Close to the public to discuss a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. And this is with respect to LSSM08-2019. Additional information related to LSS16-2019. Unsolicited offer from Egger, former Royal Line in Dunville. Moved. Councillor Metcalf. Councillor Corbett. Tony. I think someone wants you. I sent out emails. I thought she was waving at you. She's uh, waving at Tony. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All those in favor? That's carried. She's waving at all of us. 